John Bastian here from Kane Insider, joined with James Smith from NOLA and Times Pick Union. He's a recruiting producer over there. The first question I have for you is, why some high school players that are very productive don't make good college prospects? Well, I mean, there's really a bigger jump from high school football to college football than there is on any other level. It's bigger than, than middle school to high school. It's bigger than, high school, uh, than college to the NFL. You know, a lot of the high school athletes, I mean, the vast majority of them aren't going to play college football, honestly, because they don't have the goods, you know, to be to be frank about it. But uh, whereas you go to the NFL level, I mean, there's a lot of college guys that might not even have productive college careers that can make NFL rosters. There isn't that great of a talent jump. Now, there, there are NFL top-level prospects and athletes at every position in the NFL, but it's not as big of a leap. So a lot of times you see the, the deficiencies a player might have in high school uh, get exposed in college. You know, if, if you're a great running back and, and you've got blazing speed and great vision and you can hit holes and outrun all your opponents, but you are bad in pass protection or you don't have the size to be durable enough on the next level or if you, if you don't uh, understand how to be effective in the, in the passing game as a receiver, those things are going to get exposed on the college level because of the amount of coaching – and talent that goes into to, to the game. James, you've you've helped colleges find prospects for years. You worked for a big scouting company. Tell us what are some of the top things they're looking for in these high school athletes. The thing that gets overlooked most, and the only way you're really going to be able to see it, is by being on the ground and witnessing it firsthand at practice, or having a good relationship with the, with the, with the prospects' coaches. But the thing that often gets overlooked is coachability player's ability to stop whatever he's doing, to listen to the coach's instructions, and then be able to implement it quickly. You know, it's a lot of, you don't have time to sit and work on each technique day after day after day to be able to incorporate it into your game. You've got to be able to learn on the go and adjust. You know, you've got different matchups week to week, and and you really need to be able to have your, your whole plethora of, your whole arsenal at your uh, expense to be able to implement all these things into your game and coachability is one of the main factors that get overlooked and that's really hard to judge from a highlight thing. You've got to be on the ground doing it. So that's why these coaches a lot of times will spend multiple occasions with a prospect before and they want to see him at their camps and things like that before they ever extend an offer. You know, and then of course another one that gets overlooked is attitude and work ethic. Because you can easily get outworked and surpassed by a lesser athlete on the college level. I mean, people that make it to college level, the, the majority of them put in lots of work, and they want to succeed and make it to the NFL. And, and if you don't have that work ethic, then the guy next to you is going to outwork you. He's going to pass you up. So those are two things that are often overlooked and, and could possibly be the most important things outside of the natural athleticism and, and the size factors. It seems every year athletes become bigger, stronger, faster. Is that something that colleges weigh in on? Do they plan for that, or is or is this something that's kind of getting blown out of proportion? Like maybe that's been become too much of a focal point. Kind of like forty times have been overrated. Can you just touch on that a little bit for us? I think naturally you see the progression of the athlete over. I mean, beyond football, over the past hundred years, people are just bigger and faster. You know, uh, gen- genetics and, and training and the, our diets today uh, far exceed the amount of, of protein and things like that we would have been able to eat 50 years ago. I mean, there's a lot more knowledge out there and people are putting in more work to get where they want to be athletically. So you're going to naturally see a progression in in size and and strength and speed, you know. But I feel like it is somewhat overblown, but more by position group. I mean, there are exceptions to every rule in sports. That's just the way it is. You know, some people are just so gifted that whether they're too tall or too short for any position that any you know you got LeBron James who could be an effective point guard in, in basketball or you know you got six 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 eight postmen that are some of, are some of the best in the game in basketball I mean there's exceptions to every rule but positions like like middle linebacker and running back and even to some extent cornerbacks you know can be somewhat overblown uh, I have no problem with five nine running backs. If the guy is as gifted as, as Duke Johnson at Miami or Amir Abdullah at Nebraska, some of these guys just have an inept ability to be able to avoid big hits and get it done. And 
a lot of times they get overlooked. Look, now Duke and Amir obviously didn't, but there are many like them that do. And a uh, middle linebacker, especially at this position, personally, I wouldn't. I would like a six foot guy. You know, he's going to play with natural leverage and pad level. And he's going to be able to get under a lot of these linemen that are taking him head on in the hole. And he's got to have every advantage he can gain. And by being able to be a six foot and if, you know exploding into a 6-4 line and a 6-5 line, and a lot of times you can create a leverage battle that, that works in your favor and be more effective because of it. That's why you've seen so many Al Wilsons and players like that that, that come in at 6 foot in the middle linebacker and really succeed on both levels, college and pro. Definitely. And, James, at your, at your time spent elite scouting dealing with colleges, did you ever find that uh, college coaches were – Wary of smaller time schools like the the one A's, the two A's, the private schools, were they ever cautious about that, or did they evaluate those guys on a per kid basis? Well, there's yeah, it, it's almost per kid basis. I mean, there's some athletes that you know you can just tell they, regardless of where they're at, they're going to shine because they just got that package. You know, a Nelson Aguilar or somebody like that comes to mind, but then. Sometimes when you're looking at a kid and you say, yeah, he looks as good as this kid, but then you're thinking the level of competition he's playing at. And there is a perception, even among college coaches, that the coaching might not be as good on the high school level as some of these smaller schools. So, I mean, there, there are some schools that are very wary of that, and they, they won't necessarily not give offers because of it, but they want to see more. So you'll see them, you know, push for these kids to come compete at, at their at their camps, or even pay a lot of attention to what these kids do at elite prospect camps, like major seven on sevens or Nike opening things, you know, whatever there might be out there for them to be able to gauge themselves against the other top athletes. They really pay attention to that stuff, you know, because while they might not know these people and, and that are giving these opinions or, or even trust their opinions, when you see multiple people saying it, it kind of rubs off and plays you know plays a factor in the thing. So kids at smaller programs generally. Just uh, has to prove it a little bit more. So it's just to really pull the trigger. So would you say that's one of the main benefits of these seven on seven, these camp circuits that we're seeing so much of, is that these smaller time guys is, are getting a chance to prove themselves mm. against better competition, and uh, vice versa, really. Yeah, I do. Um, I think the biggest benefit, though, isn't really what they, the kind of name they make for themselves across the, the college recruiting lines. It's it's them being able to work on their craft. Um, you know, football doesn't have a big off-season program like baseball and some of these other, other sports do. And they don't have these travel teams to travel with and so on and so on. So when they're able to go out there and actually work on their craft, build confidence in their game, which is so important in football, you know, especially at all positions. But it really shines at, at cornerback and receiver and these are one-on-one competition positions at most every play, and so when it really it really affects their confidence levels, and you see a lot of kids walk away after having a good performance and carry that same confidence into their game, which makes them more aggressive and so on. Um, another thing I think is to be able to socially expand yourself. I mean, you, a lot of these kids don't travel outside of their cities or their states, and to be able to be put in new environments with new surrounding uh, players around you, you know, and having to forge new relationships on the go, that's something they're going to have to experience on the college level, and that really sets a lot of kids back with the being able to socially and emotionally adjust to the move, the transition to college. So I think that also helps with that. And James, I know you're really busy at NOLA and Times Picayune right now, so I'll ask you the last question. With all this this access that these college coaches have, these D1 colleges have, like recruiting services, they, they read and hear about all these camps and then they see how they're doing the season. How do they still miss on certain prospects? How do they have, you know, what fails or how do they have, you know, busts still after all this information is out well, there? I mean, naked eye, it looks like they're out there evaluating every chance they get and they're able to be at the schools and have all this contact with kids. And it's really not. They have such a limited window as to when they can go evaluate kids. They have so many kids they want to evaluate that some they've just never able to go put their eye on in person to person. And uh, it's just, uh, a lot, that's a lot of the main reason. And then you have, you know, some high school coaches who might not be um, as 
have experienced or, or have the in-depth knowledge of recruiting or the contacts, and so they kind of struggle at times to help some of their kids get recruited. I mean, there's a bunch of different factors that go in it, but it, it definitely happens. Um, you see less of it now than you've been in the past, and I think a lot of that has to do with the media that's present at a lot of these camps and the amount of camp circuits they actually have going now, I think plays a big role in that because every school, whether they admit it or not, every school reads what goes on these websites and what articles are written and it matters to them. So I think a lot of those, uh, a lot of those things play into all of it. Thank you for your time.